Here we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started with microbio, um, which is very nice and short because it's literally only talking about UTIs. Um, so let's have a look. We have lower urinary tract infections, and then you can have upper urinary tract infections. And the division is really just at the bladder. So lower urinary tract includes cystitis, which is infection of the bladder, and then urethritis, which is infection or slash inflammation of the urethra. Um, the main etiology that you really have to remember is that 95% are caused by E. coli. So if you're going to remember one organism for the entire renal system, remember E. coli. It's a gram-negative bacillus. It's a normal flora of the bowel. And the most typical method of inoculation is like wiping back to front instead of front to back. And it introduces um, E. coli into the urethral area. And then that can spread upwards or it can just infect locally. The other 5% um, is a mixture of Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Proteus, and Staphylococcus. There's a mnemonic KEEPS that um, will list all of them, so K-E-E-P-S. Um, but really, the only one you have to remember is E. coli. I don't think you would get assessed on any of the other four. Um, Symptoms-wise, you get cloudy or blood-tinged offensive, so foul-smelling, frequent painful urination. So usually they complain that they uh, that it hurts to pee and that they constantly feel like they need to pee. That's like classic UTI. If you have things like high fever, flank pain or vomiting, so things that feel more systemic or more high up, then they're going to be upper UTI. Um, and that's more severe than lower UTI. On a technicality, if they have a fever, it's almost guaranteed to be pyelonephritis. You don't really get a fever with a UTI as a normal UTI. Yeah because it's more of a localized infection. Um, and the, the sort of method of, um, I guess the method of introducing bacteria is from external into internal. Whereas when pyelonephritis, uh, the bacteria gets into the kidneys via the bloodstream. So it's more of a systemic, basically bacteremia. And that's why you get fever. There are factors that do predispose to UTI. So a, an uncomplicated UTI that like, you wouldn't worry heaps about is an adult woman basically um, with a lower u urinary tract infection. However, there are certain um, other possible combinations. Like if you have males with UTIs, it's much more concerning. If you have recurrent UTIs, it's much more concerning. And of course, upper UTI is much more concerning. Um, and the reason that the whole female lower UTI is not concerning is because females are predisposed to UTIs. And it's to do with the anatomy of the genitalia. So we have a shorter urethra than males. So there's a shorter pathway that the bacteria has to travel. And there's a shorter distance from urethra to anus. So again, a shorter distance that the bacteria has to travel. So that increases the risk. There are other things that increase risk of UTI. And that includes abnormal urinary tract structure. So this is what you would suspect if someone was coming in with recurrent UTIs. You might think maybe there's a structural abnormality that is causing them to frequently get infections. And that can include like strictures in the uh, ureters or like um, the reflux where the ureter is not uh, entering the bladder at an oblique angle. Um, or they can have like neurologic problems. So incomplete voiding is a big risk factor for UTI as well. Because if you're not completely empty, emptying the urine, you get stasis and that uh, helps to breed infection. So that can be like a neurologic problem if there's issues with sphincter control. Okay, so stasis, the pathogenesis. Oh, quick thing. Mm -hmm. oh yeah, we actually don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I really, yeah. Um, yeah, so the pathogenesis of UTI, it's a four step process. And the first two steps are really what we target in prevention. So the first one is periurethral colonization. This is how the bacteria gets to the urethra in the first place. Again, like I said, UTI, especially lower UTI, is usually from an external source that has then colonized up the urinary tract, as opposed to from starting in the blood and then coming outwards. So periurethral colonization, the most, I guess, frequent one is inoculation from the GIT. So when you're educating patients about how to prevent UTIs, wiping front to back is like the most important thing. And then there are other things. So post intercourse voiding is also really important for flushing out bacteria. 
And then spermicide use and catheterization, they are two things that increase the risk. So if you're using spermicides, you're killing off the natural flora, and that's going to increase the ability of pathogenic organisms to colonize. Catheterization, it makes sense as well. If you're sticking a foreign body in, you're going to be introducing um, other bacteria. Then the second step is inoculation into the bladder. So this doesn't always happen. If you don't get it, then it's just urethritis. But in order to get cystitis, bladder inflammation, the bacteria spreads up through the urinary tract into the bladder. And this is where the incomplete voiding is a big problem because you get stasis of urine and stasis is the basis of infection and also clotting. <laughs> but um, you want to recommend that they ensure that they're voiding completely. So often in children, if they get UTIs, it's because of incomplete voiding. Um, in elderly people, there can be issues with prostatic hypertrophy. So if you've got an older male, they might have benign prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, and that could be causing obstruction. Um, and that could be reducing the ability to void completely and also neurological problems. Um, once the bacteria is in the bladder, they establish themselves by adhering uh, with their fimbriae. So that's more of a, a pathogenic mechanism rather than a host factor. And then uh, the actual mechanism of damage is that the polysaccharide capsular antigens, they decrease phagocytosis and hemolysins cause renal injury. So this diagram is a nice little summary of host factors that predispose to UTI and then bacterial attributes that are sort of assist them in infecting the urinary tract. So urinary tract abnormalities, we've mentioned that they increase the risk of getting a UTI and they sort of fall into several categories, one of them being structural abnormalities, and that includes physical obstruction. So I mentioned before that the prostate is often a common cause of obstruction in a male, and it's definitely something to consider if you have a male with a UTI, because again, that is uncommon. Um, young males can have something called a posterior urethral valve. Uh, I don't know, maybe something to consider. And then the other one is vesicourethric reflux. So this is that issue where your ureters are not entering at the correct oblique angle and more like of a right angle. So you don't get that functional sphincter um, action and therefore you get reflux of urine back up the ureters. And that obviously increases your risk of upper UTI because the infection can be carried from the bladder up to the kidneys. Functional abnormalities are neurogenic bladder. So that's when um, there's sort of denervation of the, the bladder and the detrusor muscle. And as a result, you can't void completely. Um, and special physiological states like pregnancy. So upper UTI. Upper UTI includes pyelonephritis, which is infection of the kidneys, and renal abscess, which is a collected infection of the kidney. Um, and usually, again, it's spreading from below, coming from an external, usually GIT-related organism, but it can come from the blood as well. And in that case, you've got uh, gram-negative septicemia, or bacteremia for bacteria. And that's a medical emergency because they can die from that. They can go into septic shock. Um, patients will usually require IV antibiotics and IV fluids and usually need hospital admission if they've got an upper UTI. Um, and remember, upper UTI is not like a normal thing. It's not to be expected. And so usually there is some abnormality present and you would do a renal tract ultrasound to see if there's any sort of structural abnormality that might have predisposed to this infection. However, even though they are quite concerning, they usually don't cause lasting damage unless you have some sort of um, abnormality present. Okay, so this is probably the important thing. So the two things you have to remember for UTI, really actually there's three things. One of them is that E. coli is the main causative organism. The second is this number. For some reason, faculty just, they just love to test this and I don't know why, but um, this is like the threshold for how much bacterial growth you need in order to diagnose a UTI. Um, and then the third thing is to do with management, but we'll get to that. So when you're investigating UTI, if you suspect someone has a urinary tract infection, you collect a midstream urine sample. It has to be midstream in order to avoid picking up the periurethral organisms that are normally present. Like you might have some staph aureus on the skin or something. So you want to do a midstream sample so that it's sort of clean. And then you can do two things with it. The first thing is bedside, you can do a dipstick, which you might've done in OSCEs. 
or well, I guess you might be doing an OSCEs. Um, and that just means that you can assess for the presence of certain things. pH change might be um, indicative of UTI. It will usually become more alkaline. Um, and leukocytes, obviously white cells respond to infection. So they might be present. You might have nitrites, which are produced by the bacteria. And you might see blood if it's more of an upper UTI. So if there's been actual damage to the renal parenchyma, then you might actually see some hematuria. Once you've done your dipstick, you can also send urine off to the lab for microscopy, culture, and sensitivity, or a urine MCS. Um, and here they basically take a look at it under the microscope, they culture it, and they have a look at what organisms grow and what those organisms might be sensitive to in terms of antibiotics. So you need to remember this 10 to the 5 mil per milliliter of growth um, as the threshold. And then you can do a gram stain, and that will indicate potentially each of your five main causative organisms. Again, just remember that E. coli is a gram-negative bacilli. The others, not so important, not the end of the world if you don't remember those. You can also look for pyuria to um, assess like immune response. And um, the reason they have this threshold of 10 to the 5 is because it's pretty uncommon that you would get a urine uh, specimen that wouldn't have any bacteria. Because again, you do have some periurethral organisms uh, contaminating the sample. So there's a higher threshold. Treatment wise, so I've made this one here in red, trimethoprim, because that is the third thing that you have to remember at UTIs, that the main treatment is trimethoprim. Um, it's the antibiotic to which most E. coli are sensitive. Amoxicillin, so your regular penicillins, they're not used because E. coli tend to be resistant. So trimethoprim is the first line treatment. Uh, there are like other side things that you can do, adjuncts. So you recommend high fluid intake to try to flush out the bacteria. And you can give like alkalinating agents that might uh, offer some symptomatic relief. So some of the burning pain that comes with UTI is to do with acidity. And so if you can alkalinize the urine, it might offer some symptomatic relief. But the mainstay of treatment and the main one that you need to know about is trimethoprim. Um, this is sort of the course that we use if uncomplicated, three to five days. If it's pyelonephritis, 10 to 14 days. Um, but they will usually need an initial IV period because of the risk of septicemia. And then for prevention, again, educating the uh, patient about complete voiding, including post intercourse, uh, good fluid intake. And if they have recurrent frequent UTIs, you can give prophylactic low dose trimethoprim. But it's not ideal because obviously something like that is going to increase the risk of uh, resistance developing. This is a really nice summary of all the things. Um, I think this is given to you on Moodle. Um, so it kind of encompasses your upper and your lower, the organisms, which are the same for both, the clinical symptoms of each, which are slightly different, and then the risk factors. And remember just the three really important things. E. coli is the main causative organism. Trimethoprim is your mainstay of treatment, and this number. Is so, Lena, you got a question in the chat. That goes, what does the ten to the five refer to? Is it the number of cultured cells? So, yeah, so yes. it's the number of like cultured bacterial organisms per mil, basically, and they literally just count them, and then they yeah. get that number. It's I don't know exactly how they calculate it because it seems like a pain to count up. Maybe I there's a computer like that does it. They average it with like a little box thing. I think it's a science thing that we don't need to know too much. Just know it's ten to the five. Just know um, that number. Yeah. It's, it always comes up. It's the number of cells, I'm pretty sure. Um, but how they get that is probably more of a microscopy averaging thing than anything else. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll stop sharing. Any other questions about farm or not farm micro? About nope. UTIs. Cool. Um, yeah, so UTIs, I think that's basically all you need to know. Like Elena said, the two things that I really think is important are the 10 to the 5 and the E. coli. Um, the trimethoprim, I'm going to be honest, I knew about this year, but if it's important, <laughs> it's probably important. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, so you do. We so glomerulonephritis <laughs> comes tomorrow. <laughs> Elena spent tomorrow. the whole morning um, making a proper glomerulonephritis little intro. Um, you guys get taught it really badly. <laughs> yeah. Nothing against whoever the lecturer is, but it's done really poorly. So Alina will do it tomorrow. And I think JJ and I and Gavin might be there as well if we pop in some details about how we learned it as well this year. Because it's taught yeah. a lot better in third year in comparison to like second year. 
Yeah, in second year, they give you no context and just throw the conditions at you. Um, so it makes zero sense. I remember I just wrote learned like keywords for each one yeah. last year. But and in um, all honesty, that's all you need in second year. But we're going to yeah. give you a little bit better idea. So you're not clueless stepping into a nephrology ward next year and going like, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, no, it's not really tested a lot in the exams. And it's also yeah. very buzzwordy in the exams. It will be tested a lot in third year. Yeah. In third year, a lot. <laughs> in uh, second year, I think we had maybe two questions on yeah, the end of year paper. It was probably like minimal change and it was buzzwordy because of the young and nephrotic. Yeah. So it's not like the, it's not the biggest topic, but um, it's complicated. Yeah. You, you will get everything you need to know tomorrow. So tune in yeah. for that. Cool. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Alongside, if any questions from farm as well, when I'm going to go through farm. So, okay. Um, so farm, generally speaking, what I'm going to talk about is, I guess, two major ideas, basically hypertension and diuretics. Um, there's not really any drugs that are like specific, I guess, to helping the kidneys. There's no like, I don't know, I don't know what type of drugs are specific to the kidneys. So they're basically talking about more general systemic things that the kidneys are involved with. Um, but we'll look at this first. So hypertension is kind of the general principle that you're kind of working with when you're working with, um, kidney medications. So effectively what it is, it's you know, a high resting blood pressure. Hopefully you know that. And it's a problem because it's a big risk factor for strokes, heart failure and coronary artery disease. Um, but in and of itself, it rarely has any symptoms, realistically speaking. Um, it causes organ damage, tissue inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. And effectively is just not a good thing for you to have. Um, the blood pressure rise is generally associated with total peripheral resistance. So what causes the biggest change in blood pressure? Total peripheral resistance. Um, it can be associated with increased cardiac output for young people, but that's a rarer cause of blood pressure rise. Um, the limit for what is classified as hypertension um, changes and what the goal is changes a lot, but I think generally speaking 140 or 90 is bad. Um, and that's kind of like the level if you're kind of thinking about, but that level changes a bit, so it's not that more important to know. Um, okay, so blood pressure is regulated short term by the brain neuronally and long term by hormones in the kidney and adrenal glands. Um, basically, there are three methods it comes by. The hormonal part, um, I think Gavin talked about um, on Friday, um, but I'll talk about the medications that are involved with that. So the angiotensin and the RAS system, basically. Um, the baroreceptors and the baroreflex modulation, I will talk about a little bit, um, primarily because it's how explains a lot of the side effects of some of the medications we're going to talk about in a second. So um, the baroreflex is basically done through baroreceptors, which are stretch receptors, and they increase um, in afferent activity when blood pressure increases because there's more pressure on that little baroreceptor. The baroreceptors are basically a little like ball of cells that detect, or not a ball of cells, sorry, like a little bit of a, it's like a bead in the blood vessel I think it's the carotid, um, that increases the amount of activity it has when it has more blood pushing through it. Um, this change will change or increase relative to the blood pressure rather than just high blood pressure itself. What that means is that means if you have a much big drop in blood pressure, the basically will reduce an amount that it will send and that will accommodate for an increased tachycardia in response, which is what a lot of our, uh, um, some of our blood pressure medications, which aim to drop blood pressure, have end up might be doing because of the reflex tachycardia. Um, direct autonomic nervous system outflow is also a thing. Um, there's something you just need to know. Okay, so hypertension is classified into two groups. So either primary slash essential, or a secondary causes. Most are primary. And basically whenever someone says primary causes um, or whenever someone says essential even, we basically have a fuzzy idea of what's going on and we don't really know um, what the cause is. Um, same with idiopathic, basically. So 90% of the time, that's what hypertension is classed under. We have no idea what causes their hypertension, but the risk factors for our genetic smoking stress environment and diet, Basically what you'd expect, um, what you've been told basically through all your life about what is healthy. Um, that's sort of, if you don't do that, that gives you hypertension. Secondary causes, although they're only 10%, are useful to know because they're things you can change most of the time. Um, so renal and renal vascular diseases, um, this might be a little more difficult. This includes things like GNs um, or any kind of kidney injury. 
um, which caused the release of renin increasing adult angiotensin. Um, coarctation of the aorta. So this is a congenital thing. Maybe you might remember it from last year, the end of last year, um, but effectively you have a narrowing of the aorta and you have increased blood pressure because it's pushing through a kind of a smaller tube. Um, you have hormonal problems such as Conn syndrome, which is an increased in aldosterone, um, which we'll again talk about a little bit more when we talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs or intestinal receptor blockers, and Cushing's. So your classic Cushing syndrome or Cushing disease from excess of glucocoids um, will cause that buffalo um, hump and um, moon face, but also cause hypertension in one side. There are remaining other very much side effects if you need to know, or later down the year. Um, or pheochromocytoma, which is a tumor releasing adrenaline and noradrenaline. These hormonal problems, with probably exception to cons, these two we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about endo next week. Um, but these are the hormonal things. And also drugs that cause it, um, what you expect to cause maybe hypertension causes hypertension, but also NSAIDs and steroids are important ones, but they're common as well. Okay, so how it's managed is kind of this tiered pathway and you sort of just go through each of the stages. Um, specifically what's done in like real medicine is a bit different perhaps, but this is the kind of general pathway that you guys need to know of for now. So basically the idea is that you first start off with non-pharmacological treatments. And this is always the case, um, regardless of, I guess, what the problem is if you can treat it non-pharmacologically you try to so you're trying to get them to exercise you're trying to get them to reduce their weight you try and have their diet improved and all that kind of good stuff but if that fails your first line for hypertension management is ACE inhibitors or ARB so your angiotensin receptor blockers um, or your ACE stands for um, angiotensin convertase uh, enzyme inhibitor um, alongside calcium inhibitors and diuretics your beta blockers can also be used, and some might argue that beta blockers might actually also be first line in different settings. But for you guys, for this case and for this year, if you have a hypertensive patient, they need ACE inhibitors unless they have complications, let's say otherwise, at which point you probably use ARBs <laughs> um, because that's how important those are. Um, but this is a good little diagram that show, showcases that kind of tiered approach. Basically, you treat to target. Um, you treat the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs until you get to a certain point, which are happy with in terms of their blood pressure. All right, so in saying ACEs and ARBs, let's get to it. So ACE inhibitors block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and ARBs block the angiotensin 2 binding to the AT1 receptors. The overall goal of both of these is to limit the effect of angiotensin 2. And the point of that is that it will therefore limit the follow-on effect of aldosterone. Aldosterone, um, do I have a picture of it later? No. So aldosterone, what it does is normally will let potassium out and pull sodium in. Okay, and the idea for that is it will then uh, pull the sodium in and pull water in with it, increasing your blood pressure. If you don't let the sodium come back in, then the potassium will stay in your cells. Um, but it means the water won't follow with it. And therefore, you lose a lot more water through your urine, basically. Um, it's used for hypertension, but also chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, also known as HEFREF in later down the line, diabetic nephropathy, post-MI, and prevention and progression of renal failure. Um, basically, the idea is that these are your first line, and that's kind of what you need to know about them. Your adverse effects. So this is a very, very, very important detail. Your ACE inhibitors cause a dry cough sometimes, um, and it's due to a buildup of bradykinin. So the same, this process, the conversion of antigens to one to antigens to two, also breaks down the process of bradykinin. So without this, you also can't break down bradykinin. This causes a dry cough, um, which is very important for you guys to know because it's tested a lot and it's also very common so it's not even one of those things that are rare and for some reason assessed it's common um and it's also commonly asked so that's very important ACE inhibitors cause a dry cough that's like very key they can also cause hyperkalemia which can lead to arrhythmias so the reason um or not the reason so much but they can cause hyperkalemia because of this process they block aldosterone um, which normally increases potassium excretion. If you block it, it does the opposite, therefore increasing the amount of potassium you hold in your body, on your blood, and therefore you can get a buildup of hyperkalemia, 
or buildup of potassium, which can lead to arrhythmias. Normally, this isn't too much of a problem, but it's a problem if you add other drugs to it, um, or it's a problem if you have impaired renal function to begin with, um, and you might have issues from there. Um, also contradicted in pregnancy um, and hyperkalemia, as per usual. Examples of ACE inhibitors are captopril and enalapril, and ARBs are ivosartan and candesartan. Note, if it has pril at the end, it's an ACE inhibitor. If it's got sartan on the end, it's an ARB. Okay, these are very important medications to you guys to have a really good understanding of. So if you have any questions for that, message the chat or I guess shout out, but message the chat. Okay, beta blockers. So these block the beta receptors on the heart, which decreases heart rate, contractility, and decreases cardiac output. Um, it also decreases affects the kidneys by decreasing renin synthesis, as most of these are beta-1 sort of things. These aren't first line, um, and they're for people with hypertension and other comorbidities, such as chronic stable heart failure. Um, they can cause bronchoconstriction, and this is an important detail to know. So because they can cause bronchoconstriction, they, can, they are, generally speaking, contraindicated for asthmatics. And especially for you guys, they're contraindicated for asthmatics due to the action of beta-2. If you think about it, your beta, beta agonist, so your salbutamol or um, your ventolin puffer, is a beta agonist aimed to bronchodilate. So if you're giving a medication to try and help them to breathe, which is a beta agonist, you shouldn't be giving them a beta antagonist, which will cause the opposite effect and might cause them to stop breathing. Um, the AV nodal block might also happen due to lack of beta-1 stimulation, that doesn't mean you didn't know. Um, and examples are tenolol and propranolol, so your olols are your beta blockers. Um, calcium channel blockers, so these block the long type calcium channels, and there are two types, non-dehydropyridine, which is more cardiac selective, and dehydropyridine, which are more vascular selective. Um, you generally use the more vascular selective ones, and they are quite good at using hypertension, but they also, as a result, can cause reflex tachycardia. Because they cause such a drop in your blood pressure, they might increase, I guess, the baroreflexive response, causing a reflex tachycardia. Um, they are not used as beta blockers because it's a combined effect of a double, I guess, down on your heart will make it not work as well. And if your heart's already got problems with it, it might be even bigger of a problem, okay? But these are your calcium channel blockers. Diuretics, so this I will talk about a little bit more later down the line, but there are three kind of groups of di um, diuretics. Your loop diuretics, your thiazide diuretics, and potassium diuretics. I've got pictures showing kind of where they act um, later down, so don't stress too much about that. But loops inhibit the NKCT2, blocking potassium in the loop of Henle. Um, thiazide, um, present the resorption of sodium in the distal tubule, and potassium sparing blocks the action of aldosterone. So that's kind of the three things you need to know. So loop is loop of Henle, thiazide, distal tubule, and potassium sparing blocks aldosterone. These are used for heart failure, but I'll talk again more specifically about these in a sec. Um, loop and thiazide diuretics cause hypokalemia. Um, which, as a result, can be used to balance the hypo or the hyperkalemia, which might be caused by your ACE inhibitors, and your potassium sparing will cause hyperkalemia, or can cause hyperkalemia. Um, examples of these are furosemide, so this is your loop, hydrochlorothiazide, which is your thiazide diuretic, and spironolactone, which is your potassium sparing diuretic. Um, but again, we'll talk a little bit more about these in a sec. So some of these drug combinations to avoid. So basically, the general principle of this idea is that sometimes you want to combine drugs together, which is a lot of cases your antibiotics because they have different pathways and therefore increase their effects. This is great for things like antibiotics, such as your um, TB medications for your right therapy, but for renal stuff, it's not as good. So your dual RAS inhibition is not good. Um, basically, just some research has shown it's not been beneficial. But the big buzzwordy one that you guys want to know is your NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, and diuretics should not be used together. Okay? And the reason for this is angiotensin II will also constrict the afferent arteriole, um, which means they constrict the post part of it. So this is blood going from here into the glomerulus and out. The angiotensin normally constricts it. If you let it relax, that means it will open up. Do I have a picture of this? No, I don't. Um, and it will open up that a lot more if you have an angiotensin II blocker. Prostaglandins are produced to dilate the efferent arteriole, so they make uh, the entry into the glomerulus larger. 
Now, NSAIDs will block that action and therefore will close that upper little bit more and constrict a little bit more. What that means is you'll have a lot less blood supply or much lower pressure in where the glomerulus is. Now, if you compare and you add on the idea of a diuretic, which aims to kind of pull water out even faster, you basically dry out your kind of kidneys and then you have a GFR which collapses. Um, this is termed as a triple whammy. So your NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors and diuretics combined are not good. Um, I guess it's not a hard and fast rule. It can be done in like if you're a nephrologist, but for as a general sense for a year two level, um, this is your triple whammy and should not be used together. Okay. And it's actually a really important point because it's not uncommon to be on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker at the same time. That's like standard heart failure therapy. So a lot of people will be on that combination and they have to be counseled and told that you should not take NSAIDs and that if you need painkillers, you should take other types, not anti-inflammatories, um, because it's actually a really popular common combination of drugs. Yeah. Um, the way I remember this a little bit easier is NSAIDs doesn't have an E and therefore it can't be the efferent arterial. So it's the afferent arterial. Um, and then that means that these inhibitors will be um, the efferent arterial. Yeah, I realized that my typing has an error. That I've written the same thing twice. Um, I will change that in post. But angiotensin works on the efferent, so the exit arterial, and prostaglandins work on the afferent, so the, and the arrival arterial. That's how I've always thought about it. Cool. Um, these you don't really know much about, but they, for some reason, keep talking about it in your lectures. So here we go. Um, hopefully they still keep talking about it because otherwise it's a bit waste of time. This is a novel combination therapy that does work. Effectively what you have is you have a natriuretic peptide um, here and you have your angiotensin blocker here or your ARB here. Um, these, I guess, combine to have a beneficial effect by dropping your high blood pressure, but also having some form of cardiac fibrosis benefit as well, um, which is great. Um, but again, you don't really know much about these. Uh, endothelin receptor antagonists. So these are a niche hypertensive drug. Um, again, you don't need to know heaps about these. Basically, they pretend they're good for pulmonary hypertension, and that's essentially it. Um, they work by causing vasoconstriction in the endothelin, increasing the blood pressure. Um, oh, sorry, they work by decreasing that, and they can decrease the blood pressure as a result. They can be used with your PDE5 inhibitors, such as Viagra, basically, or sildenafil, which is the medical name for it, and prostacyclines. But frankly, endothelin receptor antagonists, the big thing out of this um, is pulmonary hypertension. And even then, it's kind of rare to have that used. Um, sympathetic inhibitors. So there's three sort of groups of these. So ganglion blockers, um, seen as acting and alpha-1 blockers. These were in the slides basically and it's why they're here but they're not that great. CNS acting, the one that it kind of needs to use important is methyl dopa. This was in our exam, um, why? <laughs> no idea. But methyl dopa is used in pregnant women um, who have hypertension and along with clonidine. The reason for this is because other hypertensives can't be used or antihypertensive can't be used in pregnant women so therefore methyl dopa is used. Um, it causes sedation, depression, fatigue, however, so it's not generally first line for anyone else, but it's used for pregnant women with hypertension. So methyl dopa, pregnancy, and hypertension is something that I would just know. Um, alpha-1 blockers um, can be used, um, but they are used by blocking the postsynaptic alpha-1 receptors and causing vasodilation as well. They aren't as common as your beta blockers. Um, they can cause reflex tachycardia and postural hypertension, hypotension, um, but they can also cause urinary urgency, which is a fun fact is good for your benign protastic hyperplasia or hyper, 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 yeah, hyperplasia or hypertrophy um, as it kind of increases and allows you to kind of urinate. But for in terms of a hypertensive setting, it's not used either. The big one here in this slide is methyl dopa for pregnancy and hypertension. And these are even more niche ones. Um, and they are here just for completion's sake. But I really don't think they'll assess you on this. If they do, it's a bit mean. Um, yeah, the main ones to know are like your ABC, ACE, beta blocker, calcium, and then methyl dopa. We did have an EMQ in our exam that was basically like 
lots of different clinical scenarios and asking specifically which hypertensive, uh, which antihypertensive you would use. So it is important to know like the buzzwords for what is an indication and a contraindication. So like asthma being a big contraindication for beta blockers is like a really important one to know. Calcium channel blockers, they're actually better if you have like an arrhythmia because it slows the heart down, things like that. Just the little things that help to differentiate when you would use which drug. Because yes, that stumped a lot of people. Yeah. If you're looking for like a broad one, that's like the best. If it's like got no specific problems or anything like that, the best is an ACE. If for some reason they cough because they have an ACE, then it's an ARB. And then it's the more specific ones after that. No, actually you forgot one more that's most important. Lifestyle Paradise. management. Oh, okay, yeah, nice. That was an option <laughs> in the EMQ. So if they have not tried any diuretics, they have like they have just yeah. been diagnosed with mild hypertension. You should hit lifestyle. lifestyle management first. <laughs> Get them to and stop eating drugs later. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Exercise, weight loss, all that. Yeah. All right. And now we move on to diuretics. So this is a second chunk, I guess, of um, the kidney medications. So effectively, um, kidney regulated volume and composition of body fluids. And this is kind of what we're looking at and targeting most when we're talking about blood pressure. They also create waste and maintain acid balance but that's different. Um, diuretics will aim to increase your urinary volume by increasing your sodium loss. Remember, water will follow sodium. Wherever sodium goes, water follows, okay? And so therefore, all of these sort of diuretics look at sodium as the most predominant thing we're talking about. It's also kind of why, I guess, your diet of low sodium is important um, because this is the component. Also, sodium makes you more salt, like thirsty as well, so that's not a good thing either. But this is kind of the partial reason. Um, and the aim is to reduce the volume in your ECF, okay? Um, as a result of increased sodium excretion, there'll be increase in water excretion, and that decreases your blood volume. Now, that will generally decrease your cardiac output to begin with, but overall, the idea is to reduce your total peripheral resistance as there's less fluid to kind of block that sort of process up, effectively. Um, and we will look at the specific drugs now. So loop diuretic. So as I've talked about already, the furosemide is your big one that you need to definitely know. There are other types such as bumetanide and torsemide, um, but furosemide, furosemide, I can't say it, is your big loop diuretic that you need to know. Um, these act on the loop of Henley, and these are the most potent um, loop diuretic or diuretic in general. They block the co-transport of reabsorbing sodium, as well as the potassium chloride and KCC2 co-transporter, which Gavin sort of pointed to um, on Friday, but this is this channel here. Effectively prevents sodium from leaving, and so therefore the water will come with it. Um, they also uh, have effects on magnesium and potassium, as it blocks from potassium re-entering and also potassium leaving the cell. As such, you can get problems with hypokalemia and electrolyte imbalances from this medication as well. So whilst we're talking mostly about sodium, the other electrolytes are also going to have a play around with this whole story, and that will also be there. Ferrosamide is activated orally, um, but can be given IV if need to be done faster, and it happens within 60 minutes um, for oral and 20, 30 minutes for IV. I think I put these in here because they were like a point on our exam, and so therefore that's why they're here. Um, the half-life is one and a half hours where 99% is bound to plasma proteins. It's 66% treated by the urine. Uh, but this is kind of the diagram for it. So your sodium is prevented to coming in on your NKCC2 um, receptor or your channel. Um, and potassium and magnesium is also not allowed to leave and go in. And therefore, it um, can cause um, problems in there as well. Um, okay, so when they're used, is they're generally not first line for hypertension because they are so potent, they can drop your blood pressure quite quickly and drop the fluid quite quickly. They are used more for sort of emergency situations where you need to get rid of water and get rid of water fast. So salt water volume overloads or APOs, acute pulmonary edemas and emergencies, uh, chronic heart failure, liver cirrhosis or renal failure, all of these three things are because of the fact that you have a lot of fluid buildup and therefore you want to get rid of it as fast as you can. Um, and it can also be used if other diuretics aren't working, i.e. they're not strong enough, basically. Um, it can interact with aminoglycosides or gentamicin causing ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity, nephrotoxicity and will also increase digoxin's toxicity by itself due to its effect on um, potassium. 
Okay. The next group is in hydrochlorothiazide and in dabapine. These are the thiazide diuretics. These are the two that I think are very much important for you guys to know um, and remember. I guess the ide on the end is the kind of takeaway, but then again, this isn't how it. So the ide will hopefully indicate to you that it's a thiazide diuretic. These will inhibit your NCC co-transporter. Um, and these aren't as effective as your loop diuretics for getting rid of water. Um, they also, again, interfere with other electrolytes and they will have problems with there as well, with potassium excretion um, and calcium excretion. These are used for mild to moderate hypertension um, and they have a different sort of onset time as well. Specifically, they look at this. So they block, I couldn't speak there or something. Um, they block the NTC receptor with the sodium coming in, the chloride coming in. The thiazide also enhance calcium reabsorption. So the calcium will um, be reabsorbed back into the blood. So the onset and durations, I think is good to have a general idea of. I have the feeling that they asked it to us in one question, I think for furosemide, and that's kind of why I have it for the rest of them. Um, but it was I like- I learned it. But yeah, I don't think I ever learned it properly. <laughs> if you want um, that one mark. <laughs> yeah, it's basically that. But I wouldn't call it high yield by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. I'm more so looking about like how they work. And, and by, then, sorry, by coming back, Kevin just means they're usually reabsorbed by this transporter because you're blocking it. You're, these things have already been filtered into your filtrate. And so you're not reabsorbing it and leaving it in your nephron to go out as pee. And because of that, the water is drawn in. Yeah. Um, all right, so the general side effects for loops and thiazides. So the important one, and the big, big important one that you need to know is that loops and thiazides can both cause hypokalemia. Um, they interfere basically with how um, your potassium is absorbed or kind of not absorbed. And they also, because your body is trying to not have this massive loss of water happen, well, what also happens is that your outer sterone will activate, pulling a lot of the potassium sodium back in and losing a lot of that potassium out into your urine. Um, and so the causes and the problems of that is that it caused cardiac symptoms, your arrhythmias was a problem, and your increased digoxin toxicity, which is your biggest kind of issue. And it also can cause neuromuscular system symptoms, such as muscle weakness and neurological symptoms, such as drowsiness and irritability and things like that. It can also cause gout, um, hypoglycemia and hypercholesterolemia, and erectile dysfunction. But the big one is hypokalemia. Um, with more common with loop diuretics is also hypovolemia and hearing loss. Um, hypovolemia is kind of the more kind of interesting one or most sort of relevant one. The idea is that your loop directs are a huge loss of fluid and therefore will cause a low volume state, causing some of the back problems. So dizziness from lack of perfusion or lower perfusion to your brain, weakness, um, again, similarly, and hypotension because you just lost that much fluid. It also cause hearing loss, which I think is a buzzword for things. Um, these interact with the joxin as well because the joxin is more toxic when you have less potassium as it's normally sort of blocked or acts with that sort of pathway there. So basically you don't really want to give the joxin with these medications. Okay, so aldosterone. So I think it's really important to know what aldosterone does because otherwise it makes life a lot trickier because everything that I know about these diuretics is based upon what aldosterone does. Um, so aldosterone will bind to receptors in the principal cells and increase sodium channel and pump production. So what it normally does is it will normally cause ink sodium to be absorbed and potassium to be excreted. And that's the general normal action of aldosterone. Um, this in your search is what causes the other process to cause hypokalemia. Um, but I like to think about it is that if you block this, this will cause hyperkalemia as this is reversed. This is not allowed to happen and so therefore sodium it will retain, it will remain in the urine and potassium will be maintained, causing this area here to have a higher amount of potassium. And then I think the other system is just the opposite. So therefore the other system will have high PO because this isn't happening. Um, potassium sparing diuretics are such the spironolactone and the epilurone. Um, these will act on the least late distal tubule and will block the function of aldosterone. There's also amyloride, which blocks the sodium channel um, and acts on the late this data distal tubule as well. They don't affect the aldosterone too much and they only really affect um, the, the, the sodium channel. Um, but in all honesty, this is not as common or not as 
wildly assessed as the spironolactone one is. But this is kind of what amyloride is. Um, spironolactone is sometimes used with a loop, loop or thiazide diuretic and cause diuresis without the hypokalemia as it will sort of um, mitigate the effects of that loop or thiazide directed. Uh, and it can also be used with hyperaldosteronism. It's also used a lot with people with heart failure. So it's a very common medication. It's actually a lot more common than I thought it was in second year as well. So hyperspironolactone, your potassium sparing diuretics are actually very common drugs used for heart failure. It can cause hyperkalemia um, and decrease libido impotence in some people as well. Um, Yes, they can also be used with the ACE inhibitors to conserve potassium. Um, might cause increases in potassium there. Um, epilenorone can also sometimes reduce fibrosis as well, so it's generally thought to be better. Um, but that's also something that spironolactone is sometimes thought to do as well with kind of more modern researchy things. So fibrosis, reducing fibrosis, is also something that your um, potassium sparing spironolactone medications and are supposed to do as well. Amyloride, like I said, isn't used as much, um, but it can be used with the other diuretics as well um, and cause an antihypertensive effect with thiazides, as well as primary aldosteronism. It primarily out of its effect, it causes hyperkalemia. Um, okay, so potassium excretion. So this is dependent, I guess, on your serum potassium concentration, your level or your sodium concentration, and your level of aldosterone. So those are the three factors that it depends on. Um, Effectively, overall potassium concentration is very important because a change, um, either hyper or hypo, can be life-threatening. I just want to stress this point again, that loop diuretics, diuretics can cause hypokalemia, and your ACE inhibitors and your ARBs, and your aldosterone inhibitors can cause hyperkalemia. Um, and so that's a problem there. If you combine these, it might accentuate its effect, but these are actually very common drugs to be used together. But this is a very important thing to remember because this is assessed quite a bit in terms of they cause hypo or hyper. And if you remember one side effect from having hyperkalemia, just remember arrhythmias because that's the major one. It can cause sudden cardiac death. So you don't want it to happen. Yeah. And you just want to remember the general trends. So the earlier the diuretic acts, the more effective it is in terms of getting rid of water, but also the more likely it is to cause hypokalemia. So loop, your furosemide is the most effective, but also the worst in terms of hypokalemia. Thiazide is in the middle, so it's moderately effective, does cause some hypokalemia. And then your aldosterone inhibitors, which come last, they're even less effective, so they're quite mild, and that's why they're used for heart failure. Um, and they cause hyperkalemia. So it's sort of like a gradient between the three. Cool. And osmotic diuretic. So these are kind of used a little bit more for your diabetes treatment than they are used with diuretics in general. Um, but these are kind of basically non-electrolytes and not resorbed or metabolized. They stay extracellular, acts in the whole nephron, and basically they just pull water in. Um, they're given IV, uh, rapid onset half hour, half life of one hour. These are not for generalized edema, um, as they don't do anything for sodium excretion. But they're used to kind of reduce intracranial pressure and glaucoma. Uh, not, not glaucoma, but glaucoma. Um, that's kind of the idea of that. Um, and anterior common vasopressin. So these, if you ignore blood pressure or blood volume, is also co controlled through ADH or antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin in America. But basically, they're useful to know both because they can do both things. It's secreted by the posterior pituitary um, in response to high blood osmolarity, which is an important point that we'll talk about next week, I think, um, and promote water reabsorption. Um, yeah, so it works by increasing the number of aquaporins, and this is important, I guess, for two conditions, or a condition called diabetes insipidus, where there's a lack of ADH and causing you to have massive urine output, um, and it's treated by putting with more ADH and desmopressin. Um, your V2 receptor antagonists um, also promote water excretion as useful hyponatremia. But this is kind of an idea of what this hormone will do, and we'll talk about it more when we talk about the pituitary gland next week. Um, sodium glucose co 2 inhibitors. So these are used more in diabetics than they are used for hypertension, 
But basically what they do is they um, act on this glucose absorption. Um, so most glucose is reabsorbed by the co-transporter. Um, and basically if you inhibit this, the idea is the glucose won't come in, but so will the sodium. So the sodium will also not come in and therefore will all be excreted, um, which is good. We'll come back to that um, this, one in diabetes. Um, yeah. It's not primarily a diuretic, it's primarily an anti-diabetic, but it yeah. just happens to have some diuretic properties as well. Yeah. Um, because it's got more stuff in your urine, you'll have less pool, or you have more pool of water out. But it's also good for diabetics because you're excreting your glucose that you don't want in your blood anyway. Um, I don't know what this is. Okay, so <laughs> I'm trying to think about what's going on. Um, so renal injury can also be acute or chronic, and Elena will talk about this tomorrow in a little bit more detail, or a lot more detail than this is. But acute can be classed in the pre intra or post-renal, um, and your risk factors are your excessive hypertension, your chronic heart failure, so big shock, and your excessive volume depletion, or just drugs that affect your kidneys. Your chronic um, is from irreversible loss of kidney function, which can be from acute causes, or it can be from hypertension, or more commonly, your diabetics. Your GN will also cause it, um, your chronic kidney disease as well. And this will affect your GFR and decrease that, and cause edema and hypokalemia. And also affect other functions of the kidneys, such as EPA reproduction and your vitamin D activation. But Elena will talk about renal disease itself and renal kidney injury a lot more tomorrow when she talks about AKIs and CKDs, I hope. Um, but yes. the drugs we're talking about, so kidney impairment will lead to pharmacokinetic issues as a lot of your drugs are excreted by your kidney. So there's something you need to consider when you're talking about this. So your creatinine clearance, so giving an EGFR, you to produce your renal function. Um, and can be used to change doses to avoid being more toxic and avoid, I guess, having problems there. Um, drugs can also be toxic to kidneys, is your digoxin, so used in heart failure, rarely really, but um, this works by increasing intracellular calcium by acting on the sodium potassium ATPase. And toxicity will rise with a fall in potassium and a rise in calcium. Your aminoglycoside antibiotics um, also can affect your kidneys. And metformin, use type type two diabetics, type two diabetes, um, will also have an effect on your kidneys, or more specifically, raise the potential for lactic acidosis. And again, avoid the use of the triple whammy, the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, the NSAIDs, and the diuretics, because that is they're all common medications, but they also can have a very detrimental effect on your kidneys. Um. But that kind of concludes what I had to say. So were there any questions, any queries, any concerns about any of that? I will stop sharing. Um, we've got nutrition up next with JJ. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen and you can get those. Were there any questions, any concerns? No. Can you see this? Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll race through this, I reckon. Um, maybe thirty minutes. So if you if you guys want a break, just pop it in the chat now. We can wait five minutes. But otherwise, I think we can. You know, there's only a couple high yield points in nutrition. Nope. We all good. Okay. I'm gonna speed on there we go so um with nutrition i think the main important things to know are kind of what you're looking for in patients you're looking for, so like nutritional assessments um and then things like a couple of deficiencies um, but you have to know a little bit of prior knowledge to get to those bits and then in the exam I'd say most of the questions would be things on like folate, iron deficiency, things like that. So what is malnutrition? Malnutrition isn't just undernutrition, so it can be having an excess or just an imbalance of energy or any other kind of nutrient. Um, and it's present in 40% of patients in the hospital and 30% of your general population. So it's a lot. Um, and essentially they tell you, like they give you a lot of slides on this, but what they're saying with this whole picture and with all those slides is basically that it's bad um, and it decreases your quality of life and it increases um, your comorbidities. 
this is um, scurvy. So it's a vitamin C deficiency. Like the famous story is the one of the people um, like in a boat and they don't have like citrus fruits um, and they all end up getting um, scurvy. So you get these like bleeding gums, you get fatigue, muscle and joint pain, um, hemorrhage of the skin. Um, so that's a very common um, topic. Another thing you would need to know is the protein energy malnutrition. So basically, this is for people who um, are deprived, severely deprived of nutrition. And you need to be able to differentiate between kwashiorkor core and marasmus. Um, and this is, I reckon, pretty high yield. But marasmus on this side, as you can see, um, you've got significant muscle wasting everywhere. And then because they aren't getting enough nutrition, they have a slow metabolism, they have a weak immune system, um, and they have like developmental um, impairment. And this is caused by your severe chronic deprivation in both children and adults, but more commonly in children. Um, so that would be a real world example. Kwashiorkor, on the other hand, you can see that they've got muscle wasting as well. So you have skinny limbs, but you have ascites, um, and that's fluid in the abdomen. They don't have like, that's not fat, that's all like fluid and things like that because of the protein imbalance causing that kind of um, fluid shift. Um, and they get other things like hair color loss, scaly skin, um, and loss of appetite, as well as, um, yeah, that's the scaly skin there. And that's caused by acute deprivation, and mostly due to protein deprivation. So you need, basically, the most important things, one's chronic, one's acute, one um, has wasting everywhere, and one you can see that they have a big belly. In terms of nutritional assessment, they give you this mnemonic ABCDE. Um, so you come in with a patient and they're like doing a nutritional assessment and you would go through these steps essentially. So A for anthropometric data, so things like height, weight, things you can measure, skin folds, BMI, so circum waist circumference. Um, biochemical data, so things like your blood tests, um, you can look at their serum albumin for their protein status, um, their serum creatinine um, for renal function, urine creatinine for muscle mass, hemoglobin, urinalysis C-reactive protein, which is for acute inflammation. Clinical data, um, you can actually see a lot from the actual patient. So these are kind of buzzwords that I just popped in. Um, Asynthosis nigricans is for insulin resistance, so you get it in PCOS and diabetes. Um, and that's kind of your darkening of the skin in a lot of um, folded areas. So like the back of the neck, the armpits, um, behind the knees, kind of there. Um, oral thrush, so a decrease in the immune system, spoon-shaped nails or coilonychia for your iron deficiency, that's huge. Petechiae for your vitamin C deficiency, um, but you also get in B12. Um, glossitis and angular stomatitis, so what I like to think is just someone with a really like kind of red crackly mouth, um, and glossitis is just like almost like inflammation of your tongue. So like a big red tongue um, for B12 deficiency. Tight skin, so um, reduced skin turgor for dehydration and pale skin um, for anemia, hypoglycemia, etc. This is the MUST or the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, who, uh, which ad identifies people who are most at risk of malnutrition. And then D for dietary data. So I think there was an exam question on this maybe, but like ways you can um, look for how they're eating. Um, you can go for like a diet history, 24 hour recall. So what did you eat in the last 24 hours? A food diary um, or food frequency questionnaires. And you should ask about like a range of factors. And then E for exercise and other things like social, financial, medical, et cetera. For populations, um, so basically these are like big corporations or governments collecting a lot of nutritional data um, and in the purpose essentially, I'm not going to go through them, but it's just to improve um, public health in general. Yeah. These are your nutrition guidelines. So a lot of this comes from like population nutritional assessments. Um, and these are some of the things that you might read on the back of a label, for example. So your estimated average requirement or your ear is your average daily amount required for half of the population to be healthy. 
Um, and this is pretty high yield. I reckon this is like an easy infancy cue to put in. So I think of air to be like, if this is the curve of um, the number of people on the y-axis and then the daily requirement on the x-axis, the air would be here, right down the middle because only half the people need to be healthy. The recommended daily intake or the RDI, which is often the actual number on the back of your labels, um, would be two standard deviations. So about 98% of your people would be healthy um, on that amount of food. Um, and then when you can't actually measure it, you can use adequate intake or AI to, rec to replace your RDI. Um, and then your upper limit is the highest amount that someone can eat um, with no adverse effects to almost all individuals, so up here again. Um, estimated daily requirements is your average energy intake um, predicted to maintain energy balance in a healthy person. So um, an amount that you would eat where you wouldn't really gain weight and you wouldn't really lose weight. These are your Australian dietary guidelines. Um, I'd say remember kind of the six um, mainstay things. So maintaining a healthy weight, um, eating nutritious foods from five food groups, drinking lots of water, limiting things like saturated fats, added salts, added sugars and alcohol, um, supporting and promoting breastfeeding, and then caring for food properly. Um, so storing them properly, not letting them rot, etc. Okay, so eating. Um, again, these def definitions are easy MCQs to put in. So um, differentiate between hunger and appetite. Hunger is physiological, so it's when your stomach's grumbling at you and you need to eat, it's unpleasant. Um, and appetite is psychological. So you can be full, you're not hungry, but you can see a donut and you can be like, oh, I want to eat that. That's your appetite kicking in. And then you need to differentiate between satiation and satiety. So you're satiated during a meal um, and that causes you to stop eating. And then you're full for a while afterwards and that's your satiety. Um, and that inhibits eating until your next meal when you're hungry again. Um, they've kind of got the stages of eating here. They go through a little bit. It's a little bit like, you know, pleasurable things like salty, sweet, savory, aversive, sour, bitterness. I don't think this is high yield. Um, perhaps remember the definitions for the psychological factors to stop eating um, or start eating and things like that. So gourmet, glutton, anorexia, but it, it basically it's in the name. Energy balance, um, I think, remember this, um, equation. So your total energy expenditure or the energy that um, you're releasing or using um, is equal to your basal metabolic rate. So that's basically if you're lying in bed doing nothing, just breathing, that's your basal metabolic rate, plus your diet induced thermogenesis. So that's the energy actually used for digestion, plus your physical activity and plus your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's your like walking to the fridge and getting out of bed. Um, and for basal metabolic rate, the most important thing to remember is that it's basically directly um, correlated with lean body mass, so muscle mass. Um, and it's also higher in people who are obese um, because they actually have more muscle. Um, they're it's higher in men, thinner and taller people when you need to grow or when there's stresses such as infection, um, smoking, caffeine, things like that. And then for energy in, so your intake, um, basically the energy that you can actually use is equal to the total energy intake that you eat minus the factors that inhibit absorption and then minus again the urinary or fecal losses. And so you end up with kind of like four kilocals um, for carbs and then like double that for fats, about the same as carbs for protein and then alcohols in between. Regulation of energy balance is dependent on two things. So um, your mechanisms that control your endogenous energy substrate storage and mobilization. Um, so things like your liver releasing hormones to tell your fat cells to release fats for you to use, or, uh, or well, and your satiety control. So an anorexogenic is appetite blocking, 
um, and orexigenic is appetite stimulating. I don't think you need to know this pathway very well, but know that some things decrease your appetite and some things increase your appetite. So leptin is released by um, fat cells. So the, basically it's a form of weight control. The more weight you gain, the more fat cells you have and the more leptin you'll um, have. And that should decrease your appetite. Things like insulin as well, which is released after a meal, um, will decrease your appetite. So that makes sense. And then another one um, is peptide YY336, which um, I don't think is that important, but I think it was in an exam question. Things that increase your appetite, ghrelin, I, that's released by your stomach. Um, so I remember kind of like grr for ghrelin, um, like your stomach's growling because you're hungry. Um, and then your AMPK your, and your ap appetite stimulating circuit, so your NPY and AGIP. Uh, I wouldn't say they're super important, but easy to test on. For measuring energy balance, um, like before, you can have like the food diary, the food frequency and dietary histories and 24 hour recall um, for your energy intake. And then for your energy expenditure, um, you can do that via direct calorimetry or indirect calorimetry. And direct means basically you're not predicting anything. You're basically just measuring how much carbon dioxide they're releasing, how much heat they're releasing, and you factor all of the, those things in and understand how much energy um, someone is using. You can do that by these chambers and you can imagine it has to be a very closed environment. For indirect calorimetry, it's more of an estimate. Um, and you can have a read up on these things. Essentially, they can use gas analysis, they can um, label water, and then basically you like breathe it out over time, and then they can calculate it via that. Or they can use equations where they put in like your height, your age, your um, weight, etc. On to nutrients. So um, nutri nutrients are split into macronutrients and micronutrients. And it makes sense because macro means big and you need bigger quantities of them. Um, and micronutrients, you need less. Macronutrients um, include your carbohydrates, your proteins and your fats. Um, and they're mainly for energy. Micronutrients are your vitamins, um, which are organic chemicals, if you think back to chemistry, and minerals, which are ions. Um, and they don't tend to provide energy, but they're often, you often need them in order to release them um, in macronutrient form. And most of them are essential, but the body can make some of them. Um, nutrients can also be classified as essential versus non-essential. So essential nutrients cannot be made by the body. You have to eat it. Um, non-essential nutrients or, or you can have, yeah, you don't have to because you can make it. Conditionally essential is when something that's non-essential can become um, essential because your body cannot actually make it anymore. And so you actually just have to eat it directly. And then bioavailability is the rate and extent to which a nutrient is absorbed and used. Um, yep, okay, proteins. So this is your first macronutrient. They can be complete, incomplete, or complementary. So complete proteins um, will have all nine essential amino acids, um, and you tend to find them in animal products. They're very digestible. Incomplete proteins um, don't have all nine essential amino acids, essentially, and they're found in more plant-based foods. But you can get all your amino acids by pairing two incomplete two or more incomplete proteins um, and essentially make a complementary protein. Um, and these are like your legumes and grains and beans and rice, um, and that's completely fine. I think the main takeaway is it's easy and easy to get enough protein and protein intake by the population has generally increased. Um, and it's very essential for many bodily functions. Fats should make up 20 to 30% of your total energy intake um, with saturated and trans fats, which are your bad fats, making up less than 10% of your total dietary energy. Your essential fatty acids are your omega-3s and your omega-6. Um, and it's good to remember what they do. So omega-3 is involved in your cell membranes and then omega-6 is involved in things 
also kind of like your cell membranes for your red blood cells, but also skin integrity, fertility, and growth. Um, and you should have more omega-6 in your omega-3. Um, that's not too important, but kind of remember the gist of what fats are in what. So saturated or your not so great fats um, tend to be animal products. So butter, cream, um, lots of dairy products, coconut cream and milk as well. And then your unsaturated, which can be monounsaturated, one double bond, or polyunsaturated, many double bonds, um, tend to be like your plant oils, like your olive oils, um, or your fish oils, your nuts and seeds and your avocados. And then again, for cholesterol, which tends to be bad as well, um, those are in your eggs, shellfish, milk products, meat and poultry as well. So again, everything in balance, right? But um, generally, the good fats are your unsaturated, so your MUFAs, um, monounsaturated fatty acids, and your PUFAs, your polyunsaturated <laughs> fatty acids. And then the bad, the bad ones, or the ones that should make up less than 10%, um, are your saturated fats, your trans fats, and your cholesterol. So um, I reckon this is pretty important, this table right here. Um, it's pretty intuitive though. So your saturated fats will increase all your forms of cholesterol. And LDL is your good or your bad cholesterol, um, which kind of deposits um, fats into your arteries and gives you atherosclerosis and hypertension and heart disease and things like that. Your HDLs are the ones that kind of come along and pick up the fats from your um, from your arteries. And so it's it's the good cholesterol, right? Uh, or the good lipoprotein. So saturated fats will increase everything. Um, your monounsaturated will give you a better lipid profile by increasing your HDL and decreasing your LDL. Your trans kind of does the same as your saturated fats, except it also decreases your HDL, which is not great. And then you can see that your omega-3 and your omega-6, which are both polyunsaturated fatty acids, will um, give you a better lipid profile as well. Um, they like to promote the Mediterranean diet. Um, and essentially, the, the main point in that it's, it's high in fruits and vegetables, it's, um, it's whole foods, it's got fats in it, it's not fat free, um, and it's associated with decreased risk of heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, etc. Carbohydrates. So carbohydrates can be monosaccharides, so one monomer, disaccharides, so two monomers, or polysaccharides, so a chain. Um, they should make up quite a lot of your daily energy intake, and you can find them in your breads, your grains, your fruits, starches, um, things like that. Glycemic index ranks carbohydrates based on their immediate effect on blood glucose levels. So a high glycemic index will quickly rise um, your or raise your blood glucose and a lower glycemic index will kind of spread it out as it's digested and absorbed more slowly. And the main thing to know about this is low GI tends to be better because it keeps you fuller for longer. Um, and also high GI tends to um, think, do things like increase your appetite and has a worse outcome on your liver, um, your lipid profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and often diabetic patients will have to take great care with um, things with a high glycemic index. Glycemic load will consider the amount you actually eat. So if you eat something with a high glycemic index, but you don't eat much of it, obviously it's not going to have a great impact on um, your postprandial blood glucose level. And this is glucose. So you've done a bit of this already, so I'll whiz through. Um, but essentially you need it for energy um, and it's the only source of energy for your brain, um, your red blood cells, blood cells and some of your kidney. Those but definitions is a quick thing. Those definitions of glucose are kind of important. I think they get assessed as like, you know, okay, I don't know, not MTQs and stuff like that. And like, which one is it? So they're kind of good to know. Um, it's kind of boring and annoying, but it is good to know. Mm -hmm. overall thing. Yep. Dietary fibers are long chain carbohydrates um, and they are good. 
uh, you can have insoluble and soluble dietary fibers. Insoluble ones are like a big bulky ones, um, which increase like your fecal bulk, um, decrease your transit time, makes your poos good. Soluble fibers are the ones that delay gastric emptying, um, keeps you full. Um, both are good, essentially, eat your fiber. Vitamins um, are organic essential nutrients. Uh, there are 13. And it's good to know their function and the deficiencies and then kind of like the difference between water and fat soluble. So the B vitamins are all important in energy and often important in your nerves. For tissue repair, um, A, vitamin A is heavily involved in your eyes. And that's why a deficiency in vitamin A will give you xerophthalmia or night blindness. Um, vitamin K is important in your blood and it's implicated in some drugs that you'll learn later on. Um, vitamin D is good for your bones. And then for antioxidants, I just think ACE. Um, the difference between water soluble and fat soluble, I guess is pretty, probably pretty intuitive for both of you guys, or for all of you guys. Um, fat soluble vitamins, I just think are your addict. Um, and then everything else is water soluble. If it's water soluble, you can think that it's readily absorbed. Um, it can just travel in the bloodstream easily because um, it's water soluble and your blood is basically water. Um, you can't really store it in large amounts because it's so easily transported. Um, and it tends to be excreted in urine. Um, and because of that, you need frequent doses of it. Fat soluble vitamins um, require bile for absorption because it's fat soluble. It's ca carried in the lymphatic system or if it's in the bloodstream, you need protein carriers because it's not um, hydrophilic. And then the liver can store it or repackage it for delivery to other cells and it tends to accumulate um, because it's not so readily excreted. And that means that the toxicity um, is more common. And it also means that you don't need it as much because it's stored. Yeah. Vitamin B9 or folate um, is very important. It's involved in DNA synthesis and cell division. And the main ways you would get it are from beans. Um, and I think one important thing to note is that it requires B12 to work. And so the people at risk um, are alcoholics, pregnant um, patients, and people with increase in requirement. Um, I'd say the most important thing to, or there's a couple important things, but important populations to know for this would be alcoholics, people with B12 deficiency, because you, here, yeah, it requires B12 to work, and um, people who are pregnant. And it causes a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. You will learn more about this in heme. Essentially, it means that you're anemic, so um, you have a low hemoglobin or lower oxygen carrying capacity, but you've got these huge like red blood cells and these neutrophils, these are neutrophils, with lots of um, like nuclei in them. Um, and this is kind of what you see with the mouse mouth, what I'm talking about for the angular stomatitis. And you also get things like glossitis, et cetera. Vitamin B12 um, is also important to know. It's also called cobalamine. It's required for folate function, as I just said. Um, and it's important for nerve function as well. So these are the two functions that you really need to know. You can only get them in um, animal products. And if it's in a plant product, it's probably fortified. Um, yes, okay. One of the important, really important things to know for vitamin B12 is that is how it's absorbed, basically. Um, and you can kind of go through this in your own time, but if anything, remember that intrinsic factor secreted by parietal cells in the stomach is vital to its absorption, um, which happens in the ileum. So that's the last part of your small intestine. So for B12 deficiency, the biggest group of people who are at risk are strict vegans and their breastfed children. Um, but 
yeah, otherwise it's really due to a dietary deficiency. Um, it tends to also happen in a group of people who have pernicious anemia, and that's when they have an autoimmune destruction of parietal cells. So there's no intrinsic factor and poor absorption of vitamin B12. This also gives you megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, um, and you'll get all the symptoms of folate deficiency with the angular stomatitis, et cetera, as well as neurological symptoms. So think tingling, think numbness, think muscle weakness, um, think fatigue. Vitamin D or calciferol um, is the one that you can synthesize in your body but requires sunlight. Um, and it's made from cholesterol in the skin and activated in the liver and kidney. It's important for bone growth because it makes calcium and phosphate available, which is basically what your bone is made up of. And you can both get a deficiency and a toxicity for vitamin D. So the people at risk of vitamin D deficiency are people with little or no sun exposure, um, people with dark skin or people who cover their skin or wear a lot of sunscreen outside, um, but still wear sunscreen because skin cancer. So it, with vitamin D um, deficiency, it basically just leads to calcium deficiency because it essentially is what makes it available, right? So in children, they tend to get rickets um, and you get these bow legs like this, they bow, they bow out and they get their knock knees. Um, in adults, they call it osteomalacia, which you also kind of get the same thing. It's just softened bones. Um, or you can get osteoporosis, and this tends to happen in adults, um, especially the elderly. And that's a little bit different because the bone density is actually lower and that makes them prone to fractures. Um, so hitting things and stuff is a lot more dangerous for people with osteoporosis. Vitamin D toxicity is only achieved via supplementation um, and it causes all of these issues, which you can kind of read up in your own time. Minerals are inorganic essential nutrients, and they're basically just ions. Um, for function, I think you can kind of remember them um, for bone health, things like calcium, um, phosphate, magnesium, fluoride, um, energy, iron, zinc, copper, etc. Iron is important. So um, its main function that you need, you need to know about would be for oxygen transport because it makes up your heme proteins, um, like your hemoglobin and your myoglobin, which carries oxygen around your body. Um, but it's also used for a lot of other things, um, such as catalyzing redox reactions, because you can imagine it goes from Fe2 plus to 3 plus and vice versa. You can get iron from plants and animals, but it's a little bit different. Animals have heme iron and plants have non-heme iron. And that just means that in plants, the bioavailability is a little bit lower. And that means that vegetarians and vegans need 1.8 times as much iron due to a low bioavailability. And you can also see here um, that females need more than double what males need. And that's basically just because um, females get their period. Um, and so they're bleeding blood out and with it, they're bleeding their iron out. Um, but also things like pregnancy or lactation will increase your need as well. Very, very important to know that it's absorbed in the duodenum. Um, I, it's not as important to know the exact um, things that affect it. I'll leave that to you guys. Um, and also the uh, molecules that are kind of involved with it um, are nice to know. So transferrin transfers Fe2 plus around in the blood and then storage is in ferritin. Um, just, a, just a quick thing to add on to the absorption stuff in the story there. Um, it's kind of important to know where iron, folate and B12 are absorbed and it's in that order. So it's IFB, there's like a funky acronym for it and a funky mnemonic for it. Um, which makes this instantly not child friendly, but it's IF bitches. Going from the duodenum to the duodenum to the ileum um, is the order and the location which those three absorb. So iron is duodenum, um, the folate goes into duodenum, and the B12 um, goes in the ileum. And that's kind of the three locations where those nutrients are absorbed. It's kind of important to know. Yep. Okay, um, iron issues. So iron deficiency is the most common nutrient deficiency um, and at risk people are basically women 
Um, your, this is big in your clean skills, right? So you see your spoon shaped nails and your anemic signs. Um, other than that, you get like other, these are basically all anemic signs of anemia, um, basically. And the treatment is to prevent instead of cure it, but you can give them oral iron um, or sometimes you can give them iron infusions as well. Iron toxicity also doesn't happen often. Um, the big thing to know about this one would be hemochromatosis, which is a genetic disorder um, that affects quite a few people. Um, you tend to get things like a change in skin color. Sometimes they say it's bronze skin, sometimes they say it's slate gray skin. Um, they also get hepatomegaly because the iron is so toxic to um, their liver, so they get a big liver. And to treat that, especially with the hemochromatosis, um, they'd often just like let blood out, they'd donate a lot of blood. Calcium um, is important in blood clotting, nerve function, bone like before, um, muscle contraction, um, if you can remember back to your um, muscle cycle. Um, you, I think the big thing to know about this would be it's kind of related to vitamin D and it's basically just your um, bones. It's stored 99% in your skeleton and your teeth. So for deficiency, kind of the same um, as vitamin D because this is the way vitamin D causes issue, deficiency causes issues. So same risk factors-ish, um, lactose-free diets, strict vegetarian diets. Um, and then um, people end up with a lower bone mass. Refeeding syndrome um, is basically what they worry about when someone is severely malnutritioned or un they have, they have under-eaten for a long time. Um, and then they suddenly start eating a lot again. Um, so this might be, for example, an anorexic patient who gets admitted to hospital um, and then has to start eating again. And it's actually very severe. Um, it causes like severe fluid and electrolyte shifts. Um, and because of that, your electrolytes will, or shifts, or like your lowered phosphates, um, magnesium and potassium will cause a lot of complications. Um, and so your risk factors is essentially, this is like the, the detailed um, version, but it's essentially just being underfed. And these are your complications. I just remember low phosphate, potassium and magnesium, um, but you also get like fluid and glucose shifts. What they do... What they do to prevent this is essentially feed them slowly and supplement. Um, so you can see in detail here again, I'm not gonna go through it. Essentially just give them, give them things slowly and try to correct these um, low electrolytes by giving them more if required. The idea behind refeeding syndrome is the idea that they've not eaten for so, so long. They have like deficiencies in literally everything. Um, and so when you start feeding them and like giving them lots of food, their cells are like, oh my God, there's so much nutrition. So let's pull that into the cells. But what happens as a byproduct of that is that they pull literally everything from the blood into the cells and therefore causes low potassium, low magnesium, low phosphate in the blood and therefore that causes a lot of the symptoms that you get and so that's why kind of repeating them slowly is really important is to try and prevent that as much as you can to prevent that kind of shock i guess the system gets um by suddenly having food um and energy yeah and that's kind of why this sort of happens mm -hmm. um that's it from me any questions oh, i'm recording now yeah